It's very often you find these YouTube videos giving harsh critique to historical movies. And I mean, negativity has its place, it's probably entertaining, but contrary to my clickbait title, I kinda wanna be more constructive in this video. As some of you have noticed, my videos are framed from a creative standpoint. I always try to present historical information so that it can be used for creative purposes. You know, writing, D&D campaigns, artwork, that sort of stuff. So this video is partially a compilation of stuff that is forgotten about pirates, which should be included to provide a more authentic experience. And if you don't care about this, then you might still learn some new history. It's usually about the little things, which you could easily fit into any piece of pirate media. For example, we always hear about how much pirates like to drink rum. This is true, of course, but they also love to smoke. And yeah, this video was initially conceived when I went to the grocery store and thought, hey, I want to talk about pirates and tobacco. Tobacco was huge in the 1600s. Even in a poor country like Finland, the common folk, both men and women, were frequently seen smoking tobacco. You went to London, people were smoking everywhere. In the taverns, the brothels, the coffee shops, at the barber. If you entered a public establishment, the walls would have been smudged, and smoke would have clotted the walls in thick droves. It was even worse in the Caribbean. Everyone smoked. Men, women, Englishmen, Dutchmen, Frenchmen, Africans, Spaniards, Indians. The English, French and Dutch preferred to smoke from pipes. White clay pipes were the most expensive and best to smoke owing to the cleanliness of the material. These were imported from Europe. Terracotta pipes were cheaper and often made locally. Wooden pipes were the cheapest and the worst to smoke. Pirates sometimes smoked from improvised pipes. I've seen accounts of crab claws being used and coconut shells. Spaniards, blacks and Indians smoked only from cigars. It was common with their aristocrats, women, sailors, even their slaves. The most rudimentary were just freshly rolled tobacco leaves. The fancier sort were more akin to what we see today. They were frequently stolen by pirates. They may have smoked the cigars, but were just as likely to rip them apart and put the bucket in their pipes. So yeah, when Jack Sparrow and Gibbs are sitting in that Tortuga tavern, they shouldn't be drinking rum. They should be drinking rum and smoking their pipes. And the plants would probably have died. This video is largely an epilogue to my first Pirate Media Month, in which I covered Curse of the Black Pearl and some topics related to it. I only discussed the history related to this movie, but I know some people wanted an analysis of the literary qualities. For this purpose I highly recommend that you check out the YouTube channel, The Sea Empire. He's basically dedicated to covering the POTC franchise. He's got some good videos replying to Nostalgia Critics videos on POTC and other material discussing the franchise, including some of the history. So if you want more POTC, please check out Sea, pass him a pipe and a cup of hot cocoa. Because pirates did not only drink alcohol, their favorite beverage was hot chocolate. Both sugar and cacao were common sights aboard the Spanish ships they plundered, allowing them to consume gallons of cocoa a day. Historically, we often see a high priority put on acquiring and distributing comfort goods like tobacco, even in survival situations. Because you need something to keep yourself sane. And for pirates, it was often documented to be cacao. If a crew decided to part ways, for example, they would split their cacao evenly between the two companies. They sometimes prioritized acquiring kettles and ingredients to make hot chocolate. What about recipes? Most common was just water, cacao and sugar. If you are a veteran of my channel, you probably saw this one coming. Pirates are always found aboard large ships. These vessels were uncommon in the Caribbean, because the colonies usually didn't have the resources to construct lots of them, and they were unsuited for the geography. Most American sea craft were canoes, piraguas, sloops and barks. Consequently, they were the most common pirate ships, and they were perfect for the Caribbean. It's almost an inland sea, with lots of little islands, rivers, shallow waters and reefs. Big ships could easily run aground so a pirate could use these treacherous waters to hide, ambush, or escape. Pretty much all ships, regardless of size, were fitted with large oars, so the pirates could even propel in light winds. These small ships were also easier to maintain. Ships in the Caribbean need to have their lower hulls scraped and burned three times a year to prevent Torito infestations. To do this, the ship has to be tipped over. We see this portrayed accurately in black sails, and this was much, much easier to do with a sloop. These vessels primarily lurked along coastlines, seldom moving far away from land. 
so it's not like in the movies, where pirates are always on the open sea. If you want big ships and open oceans, your movie should be set in the Pacific, West Africa or Indian Ocean, where pirates used big ships more frequently. But like I said, part of the reason behind their popularity was just how common they were in general. Most merchants, navy and fishermen in the Caribbean would have operated out of small vessels. So these picturesque David vs Goliath scenes with a small pirate sloop vs a big merchant ship were rare. Most commonly it was a sloop vs a bark, etc. If pirates attacked bigger ships, they preferred to do so in concert, two or three sloops vs one ship. As you might imagine, smaller ships couldn't carry as many cannons as the big ships in the movies, so you wouldn't have the same epic broadsides. Combat was centered around musket volleys and boarding combat. Muskets are not seen nearly enough in pirate movies. They were the rover's favorite weapon. Several volleys of small arms was often enough to make the enemy strike their colors without the need to board and risk your life. Pirates are usually portrayed as freedom fighters duking it out against some oppressive regime. To answer the question if pirates really were freedom fighters, you have to ask, what is freedom? For a pirate, freedom was doing what he pleased. Drinking, eating and smoking as much as he wanted. Wearing whatever clothes he wanted, listening to music all day, not having to do hard labor. It sounds like a utopia, but none of this came for free. Pirates afforded these luxuries by stealing them. Was the robbery morally justified? Sometimes they stole from abusive corporations, like the East India companies, who sold slaves, deprived native peoples of their food and resources, and sometimes engaged in piracy themselves. Sometimes the pirates stole from slave plantationers, but they were just as likely to steal from poor fishermen, from Native Americans, and independent merchants with families to feed. And they were just as likely to trade with slave plantationers, or even become them. If they wanted to listen to music all day, they needed musicians. Some pirates knew how to play music. Other musicians were forced at gunpoint. Pirates also forced doctors, navigators, carpenters, even regular sailors to do the day-to-day -day labor. Some pirates even owned indentured servants. Fellow Europeans bound to their service by a contract. We have one instance of a pirate being accused of sexually assaulting his servant. Pirates could afford to lace the day away because they had slaves aboard their ships. They forced the slaves to do their drudgery like cleaning, cooking and manning the pumps. Free sailors could have tended to expert tasks like handling the rigging, but theoretically a pirate crew could have chilled all day while their slaves cleaned their ship and pumped the water, and had forced men managing the sailing. Pirates were free from oppressors, sure. Free to oppress. It's kinda like modern criminals, such as the Mafia, saying things like, sure, I do bad things. I force people to pay me money and kill them if they don't. But the government does the same thing. Movies, games and illustrations tends to get the visuals of a pirate pretty wrong. We usually see pirates with beards, Pretty much all evidence points to pirates having been clean-shaved or at least worn moustaches. The idea of pirates having beards stems mostly from 19th century illustrations, which wanted to portray pirates as social pariahs. The one exception would be Blackbeard, and you know, he was the exception. If every pirate had a black beard, he wouldn't have earned that nickname. Regular sailors are exclusively portrayed as clean-shaven, but you might say, these aren't pirates. We do have eyewitness illustrations of pirates, they're either shaved or have moustaches. A few of these depicted men were Bucanyi, hunters and frontiersmen, on the island of Hispaniola. They would have spent months out in the wilderness, yet in this picture, they're depicted as clean-shaven or mustachioed. The same seems to have applied for pirates who spent long periods at sea. The privateer crew of George Shelbach were described as an inconsiderable company of boys, since they were all clean-shaved and looked like young lads. These men weren't fresh from London either, they had been roving in the Pacific for two years and had recently endured a shipwreck, yet apparently bothered to shave. And you might say, oh, the pirate couldn't bother to shave. Well, since he didn't have to do so much work, what else would he do in his spare time? Neither did he have to shave himself. Racers were scary and hard to master, so sailors were shaved by their friends, or most commonly, the ship's surgeon. We always see pirates wearing tricorn hats in the movies, also called cocked hats in the period. They came into fashion around the early 1700s, but that was on land, and amongst the upper classes and military. The common folk, and especially seamen, had their own fashion. Tricorns do not seem to have been popular among seamen until the 1730s, 
which is after the golden age of piracy, and they only remained in sailors fashion for about 20 so years. So what kind of headwear would pirates have worn? Most common were just regular round hats. You could fold the brim in a variety of ways. It was very popular for pirates to cut the brim on the side, leaving only a frontal screen, akin to a modern baseball cap. Screened headwear was popular with pirates throughout the golden age. Exquemlin described the buccaneers as wearing Montero caps. In the early 1700s, sailors wore barge caps. If you didn't want to obscure your vision of above, very important on a ship, they could be flipped around gangster style. It is also uncommon to find musicians aboard a pirate ship on the big screen. They would have been found on almost every pirate ship, playing drums, trumpets, fiddles, bagpipes and jaw harps around the clock. Pirates valued them very much for entertainment. They also sang songs, but sea shanties as we know them did not exist. I know at least one movie which composed the soundtrack entirely with paired instruments. Treasure Island from 1990. Jaw harps and ancient instruments very often found on pirate ships are used for ambience in certain scenes. <laughs> Lastly, we have to talk about diseases. Because you're sick in the... Uh, diseases are very often neglected in period media. Beggars, cripples and sick people were everywhere, including pirate ships. Syphilis was one of the most common diseases and people used these black patches to cover up their blisters. Yellow fever and malaria too. Some of the characters in Treasure Island are smitten by it, though it is largely inconsequential. It would be fun to see disease play a larger part in plots. A character could go insane from syphilis or its treatment, a mercury injection into the urethra. There was scurvy, of course, though a lot of pirates seemed to have eaten enough fruit to effectively counter it. I think of the character Foyt, a lawyer in the series Taboo, a smuggle punk and spiritual successor to the pirate series. He's riddled with smallpox scars, which would have been a common sight. Some people also pointed out on my last video that Jack Sparrow has a blister from syphilis on his jaw. One can speculate as to why. This week I have a bit of a special announcement. On the 23rd of September I intend to host a live stream to celebrate hitting 50k subscribers. You're free to attend and just hang out or ask any questions you have. The time will be 17pm Central European, which should be 10am Eastern Standard Time. You'll have to convert it to your local time yourself. Anyway, hope to see you there. Huge thanks to my generous channel members and Patreon supporters. In particular, Cole Freer, Max Dweck, 1660, Michaela Jans, Daniel Stryker, Sea Dog, Randall Devere, Old Man Said, Krillov, Nick Hooper, and Captain Jake Rumdrinker. If you'd like to hang out with fellow pirate enthusiasts, please check out the link to our Discord server in the video description. Hope to see you there. Cheers!